Germany. So we prepare ourselves for this talk. Uh, dear colleagues, I'm very happy to introduce this panel today. Uh, my name is Mark Lane Connor Reif. I'm professor uh, of linguistics at Moscow State University. And uh, my co panelists. Director, uh, Fraunhofer Institute for Systems and Innovation. Mariana Todorova, who is the founder in chief executive officer of DG Agora. Howard Wu, who is president of Can Achieve Canada. And um, we also have here Royston Flood, president of CSPOC, philosopher, educationalist. And uh, now I'm sure you will have plenty of opportunities to introduce yourselves, colleagues. But um, as, a, as, as a way of, of the beginning, just to start for this panel, I would like to briefly present my vision of this talk as I see it, and then every one of you will just will react to what I'm saying and, and present your ideas. Um, so we are, we are speaking about the future, and uh, we are thinking about how, how our planet, our world, is going to look in the future, and whether we have any points of growth in the future, and what are, what are those panels that will panel, just points that we need to nurture. But um, from my point of view, uh, future doesn't exist because uh, it is something that we are creating right now. We are creating, working together. And uh, uh, future is actually a combination of uh, variables. And the equation that we are building right now is not available yet. We need to think of this new equation and new variables. Our planet is changing demographically, intellectually, physically, climatically, our, 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 our planet is changing. Therefore, we can't speak about the future from my point of view, uh, using only the variables that we already know. Everything has changed organizationally, administratively. People uh, are living in a new way. Therefore, I think this panel needs just to discuss, to work out certain strategic plans, strategic scenarios and streams for for other companies to see, for people to see, and uh, maybe make solutions for decision makers. Decision makers are also looking at this at this panel, and uh, and the more uh, the more suggestive we are here in uh, in presenting our ideas, the easier it would be for all of us um, to live and work out what we're going to do in the future. Um, Royston Fluid, may I ask you to begin your vision because you are the edu educationalist, you are a physicist, mathematician. You have such a, such a huge horizons of vision, and I'm sure this uh, vision that includes the person of, of digital humanities, physics, mathematics, and from all kind, from all aspects of life, will give us a very interesting insight into this uh, great challenge that we are having right now. Please. I think first of all, I'd say it's an enormous challenge. Um, we're at a place in history where you can't define the future by looking backwards. We are, at most people would say that we're probably beyond the tipping point. So part of our challenge is to manage uh, as best we can. Um, I, I just put a couple of slides together just as a, as a hopefully helpful So for me, it's about uh, understanding that we live in a very complex world now, uh, and somehow we have to bring health, education, enterprise together to deliver outcomes in the environment, citizenship and value generation while celebrating diversity and inclusion. At C-Spot, we're focused on developing self-sustaining solutions um, by linking all these elements together. And I think the, the answers will be by collaborative explorations of, these, of this new frontier um, and finding ways where people can live together in harmony. The challenges as I see it in, on those topics, in terms of health, we're living in a world of pandemics. We, we're probably just at the starting point. There are many other viruses that are still there. And one of the biggest challenges is mental health and how we help people 
avoid depression. We have an aging population where the cost of health care in the last 10 years of life is catastrophic, and we need to look for prevention rather than cure. And I, I tend to take the view if we could create a, a body driving license so people could drive their body effectively, we could dramatically improve, improve the quality of life. Education, historically, we've had a test-based system, which I think is now obsolete. We need to move to hybrid learning, which is a mixture of one-to-one, -one, online and peer groups. And we find if you create tetras of a seed plus a storyteller, listener and observer, you can dramatically improve educational outcomes. Teachers can be nine times more effective. And you can create a cascade coaching and mentoring process to leave nobody left behind. And that, I think, brings us to a, a new thought about lifelong learning, which celebrates creativity and curiosity. Enterprise, I think uh, global networks, global, large global players is, is, again, maybe we're finding that somewhat flawed. We need to look at local networks. Home working has created new frontiers. We need to manage with limited data, and we need to uh, become entrepreneurially clever at the grassroots. And I think CM manifesting in small and medium-sized businesses is probably the answer to that. As an outer journey, we, we're our relationship with the environment. Uh, friends tell me we're already beyond the tipping point. We are likely to see catastrophic change in the next few years, and we need to explore this idea of harmonious living. And citizenship, we need to find a way where we celebrate diversity and inclusion. I tend to feel that we need some sort of rites of passage to citizenship where people are certified as good citizens around some sort of moral compass that celebrates virtues and values. And in terms of wealth generation, we need to uh, find mechanisms where wealth is retained within communities rather than distributed around the world to centralized uh, private wealth management systems. Innovation needs to be celebrated and controls minimized. And I think finally, the, the controls and procedures, we need to look at a different model. I, I'm enchanted by the Swiss model, which has the commune, the canton and the federal with smaller levels of power as you go up the system. But at the commune level, it's the quality of the family unit and where people know each other, they work together and they solve problems together. I think uh, online referendums, if you can do it quickly using electronic systems, uh, are very valuable. And finally, we need to move to long-term planning because if you look at the Chinese model, you look at many other models, having a longer-term viewpoint. Um, governments are usually elected for four-year phases, but if we could find some way of creating a, a strategic plan that goes across um, political divides, uh, that, would be, that would be fabulous. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Royston. Um, Jacob, uh, Royston was just speaking right now also, uh, all, uh, about different players in this uh, future world. And he was also mentioning the governments and, uh, uh, and the greater transparency of borders and, uh, and the way people communicate with each other. What is your vision of that? What is, the, what is your vision of the role of governments, of the role of uh, regulators in this world? And uh, do they play a great role, actually? in this changing new world? And um, what is the status from your point of view in this new world? Well, the new, I'm not so sure how much the new world is, but how much new the new world will be. Uh, but, but I mean, can I, can I, can I, I will answer your question in a second, but can I just make two comments to, to Royston first, if I may? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Very inspiring. Just, it, I think it, you told us that that the crisis is also a, a catalyst, can be a catalyst for good things. So when you said hybrid learning, I mean, that's something that we have now done and all of a sudden we realize maybe we need to be much better in it, but there's a big opportunity in that. And it, it, I think it spurred a lot of a lot of interesting, very philosophical thoughts, your experience of the crisis. And I don't think we have time for it, but some of them I think would need a really serious debate. Uh, let me just, I mean, you, you, you said innovation controls minimized. Um, you said a certified moral compass. And you said online referendums. I mean, if you combine all these three things in a Trump world in the US, where does that lead us? Where, who sets the moral compass in a world with the President Trump? 
who does do that? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm not joking. Of course, in your moral world, in my moral world, the moral compass would be great, and it would be great to have a certi to have it certified by some agency, where we have, and then we have online referendums with all kind of you know, left liberal people like we might be in this panel. But that's not the, how the world is. So that brings me back to government. I think government in a in a in, in a democratic state, obviously, uh, plays a crucial role. We have seen in the crisis that. Uh, in some countries working better, in others working worse. It's government orchestrating the reaction to the crisis in ways that are, at least in Germany, not very, very, very effective, but they do some good job, I think, and they do it in ways that are novel in the German system. We have a way of cross-government activity and of, 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 of giving directionality to activities to solve this crisis. So they're working together across government to just focus on this crisis. And uh, there is a participation of different kind of actors and an orchestration of the system to fight this crisis. Now, I wonder, can we not maybe learn out of that and uh, and think what are what are the big challenges that we have out there? I mean, climate change has been mentioned, tipping point, but there are many others. But climate change is the crisis. Have we not learned that if we really must, we can orchestrate our activity, we can give directionality to innovation, that's our topic, in ways that might then just bring about number of innovations and application of innovations that that help us to help to, to solve the, the problems we have defined together. We have defined bottom up, we have defined in the participatory approach, but the most important thing is that we orchestrate that. So the state not just trying to make us more innovative, but make us more innovative in ways that we as societies want. And this is done through through the orchestration of the state, and that, of course, then is checks and balances through our electoral system, through our democratic system. We, if we don't trust our, electoral, uh, our democratic system, then this doesn't work. So I'm not a statist, I'm not a top-down person saying that let the state tell us what to do, but if we organize uh, the definition of where we want to go as societies, then this kind of orchestration that we see now um, can can spur innovation in much in much more productive ways. Again, I'm not saying we should cut off grassroots activity, but I'm not to the contrary, we should we, we should support it, but help to orchestrate it to bring it all together. So when I say state, I of course don't mean all these levels that you talked about in, in Switzerland. We have a similar system in Germany, three levels. I mean the state in all of these levels, not just the state in Berlin. But this orchestration and this giving directionality. In the, in, in the direction where we as societies want to go. I think that's, that's maybe the biggest lesson. And the, and the, and the second lesson for me, um, it, and that has, that has started before the crisis and it's now e e even worse. It's a bit of, there's a bit of a dilemma here or, or a strange, ironic tension. We have seen in the crisis that we are extremely interdependent. It makes absolutely no sense if only Luxembourg is free of all, of all the virus and, 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 and Germany and Belgium and France is not. Of course, that makes absolutely no sense. So we, we all need to fight this together. And at the same time, we realize if we f try to find solutions together, we are much, much faster. It's not just one country, one lab. It has been knowledge coming together for decades to international knowledge to fight this. So, so before the crisis, we had in the Trump world, we had this going back to the nation state. We have these global uh, trade wars. We have protectionism. We have what we call a quest for autonomy and technology sovereignty and all of that. So it's about how can we how can we be self-sufficient? How can we make sure that we can create the innovation that we want? If we so, but with the crisis in mind, uh, this is not ironic, isn't it? Not ironic because we have learned that we are so interdependent, we, we we will never be able to do it alone. It's actually dangerous to try to do it alone. So. So the crisis should not lead us to think, oh, in the end, when it's really bad, it's the nation state, the only the nation state who can do it. That's what some people now say. We have now big backlash to go back to the nation state because it's the only one providing the solidarity that we need and providing the means that we need. This is the wrong uh, reaction. Uh, unfortunately, because of this tro trade war stuff with Trump, this, this now seems to be a wave that is hard to control. So my second lesson would be stop, think about the interdependence, not only of the consequences, but also of the core of, 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 the, of the way we are able to fight crisis and to tackle challenges. And, uh, and while we, of course, have to be resilient, 
on a local and a national level, I'm not I'm not naive. We have to we have to be clear. The independence of our crises uh, must be met with independence of of solutions. That's very very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. Well, uh, what you said is, is is highly important. You you speak about orchestration, but I'm not quite sure whether orchestration is an ideal solution for 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 all nations, and many people would not like it. Um, Maria, uh, Mariana, you are a futurologist. Mm. Well, from your from your point of view, do you think that the new environment, that the environment that we are coming to, let's say in about ten years or fifteen years or twenty years time, will be the environment that we can actually imagine right now? I mean, as a futurologist, do you think that the number of variables in this in this equation of balance of civilizations, of countries and nations in the world, will be like we see it right now? Do you think we are expecting more variables to appear in the future? And we have to think of things that that were unthinkable in our time, and we need to take into account new psychologies, new approaches, new visions. So, this from from your point of view, from the point of view of futurologists, how should we consider this the, this matter? And Jacob uh, was speaking about orchestration. Uh, how do you treat that? Uh, thank you, Marklin, for your leadership and for the lovely question. Actually, I was going to touch this. Uh, because there are two main approaches to future. One is to describe it according to the possibility, possibility, uh, and what we are expecting according to variables. This is the descriptive approach. And the second one is the normative approach where we create strategies and want to colonize the future by backcasting, describing what we want to achieve and then considering and taking uh, certain uh, measures. So probably uh, this is what Jacob uh, meant when uh, he talked about uh, orchestration. Uh, this is just uh, pure strategies that we can take now and colonize the future. Of course, we could not conduct uh, each process and we could not uh, realize what the, the wishful of future because uh, it's out of uh, our capabilities, but at least we could uh, try to do that. And um, let's just talk what the companies and uh, corporations could, uh, could uh, do it uh, in this new context. Uh, because even before the new reality and the coronavirus crisis, uh, progressive companies began to impose a vision uh, focused on people, the planet, and the prosperity. But actually, the COVID-19 uh, is a game changer because, on the one hand, it accelerated the technology, digitalization, and implementation of AI, and on the other hand, it forced companies and corporations to be more innovative and to look for completely different approaches to their customers. And corporate social responsibility is not sufficient as a tool for a company to be described as different and progressive. And various campaigns and causes improve the company's image but do not engage consumers permanently and sustainably. And the slogan, business as usual, is dead or dying. Uh, the company must deliver not only financial performance, but to show how it makes a positive contribution to people in general, to customers and society. And my claim as a futurist is that we are entering the era of co-creation from co-creation of solutions, services, to co-creation of meaning and values. And to answer the question, if we can transform the current situation so that uh, it does not seem like a digital authoritarianism or lack of physical freedom and dictates of algorithm, we have to include in digitalization the human decision making of as many people as possible. And that's why my startup co company elaborated a blockchain-based platform for 
uh, electronic voting and decision making that allows uh, digital uh, activism, shareholders activism and uh, stakeholder activism. And how I elaborate it, I'm a former politician and uh, I, what I observed is that current democracy, representative democracy is already in crisis. And that means that decision making on the way we know it is also in crisis. So I was inspired by the principles of liquid democracy and created this uh, platform. Its name is, is DJ Agora, which is software as a service to empower public companies, social and civil movements and governmental bodies uh, to engage their members, their shareholders, their stakeholders, their um, clients, uh, in an uh, inclusive way, and what is most important is to uh, make possible to apply uh, liquid democracy in uh, decision making. And this is a way to vote directly or to delegate your voting right to a confided expert during the decision making or consensus building uh, process. And in case of companies, I elaborated this for political parties and governmental bodies, but I saw it's uh, quite successful in uh, public companies because by delegating trust uh, and voting rights, uh, individual investors or customers uh, can, uh, can exercise feedback feedback over over the company and all, all companies that want to collect feedback and to uh, include the opinion of the shareholders and customers or those who want to go green or to uh, have a new uh, comparative advantage could use that and uh, a, a lot of other uh, digital approaches but uh, those that uh, under uh, that uh, underline uh, the power of people because otherwise we are going into dehumanization uh, processes and uh, decisions taken by algorithms. Thank you. Uh, you were speaking about you were speaking about the future as the as a territory of co-creation, and and this means that you have a strong belief and faith in human civilization and in the capacity of a human being in the future. Uh, I'm going to ask well, Patricia Bonner. Uh, you were actually investing a lot in developing the idea of creative teams and uh, and developing teams of people who can be working together. Well, first of all, I would say that. I have uh, I have lots of concerns about uh, human teams in the future because uh, the digital environment is actually encroaching on our territory more and more actively. Therefore, well, uh, I have concerns really whether co-creation will work as effectively as we imagine right now. What's your vision of that in uh, in the context of future development? Thank you for the question, Martin. Um, I, I would first go back to your first, you know, in, in introduction when you were talking about the future is not existing. And I think that uh, we create the future. We are part of the solutions and we are also part of the problem. And so the way we are looking at how we can be actively involved in creating solutions, that's how the future will, um, will develop itself. And, um, and of course, this crisis, this, this COVID-19 crisis has, um, has allowed an, an immense opportunity for technology to um, to be very present in the world, and of course that this this is uh, accelerating and dehumanization. But I think that's how, if we look at technology as we have been looking at till today as a tool, and technology is run is running us. But if we look at technology for good, and if we really put all the algorithms that uh, allow humanity to become more present and to use the technology to our own purpose, then technology will work with us and we can create a world where technology is, uh, is creating more human values in companies and more humanity wherever it needs to be. And so that's, that's the way I look at the future and that's the way how I am implementing uh, technology in companies that I'm working with. And through Mixer, we are using technology to um, bring people together around shared interests. And to me, the, the, the shared interest is, are the first building blocks of trust. And, and if we are looking at the future, 
Uh, and if we want to be creative and innovative in bringing To, for a team to be creative, for um, to to create to create innovation and to create growth, and so um, it's it's all about the trust factor in companies. And um, I would like to refer to a great book that is uh, written by Stephen Covey, "The Speed of Trust," where we see that um, if trust is high, then the speed of business is high and the cost of business is low. And if the trust is low, then the speed of business is low and the cost of business is high. And I think this is really something to keep in mind that trust is the, is the, is, is the key element for companies to, um, nurture growth and nurture, um, nurture innovation and creativity. And a long trust is also the belonging. Because I think if you are in a space where there is mutual respect, where there is trust, you start to be creative, you start to belong to a place. And, uh, and belonging to a community, belonging to a workplace, that's probably the best way to start solving mental health, which numbers we see rising since this crisis. So that's how I would respond to your question of or your fear of technology. In, uh, in, in tomorrow's world. That's a fantastic insight. Thank you. Well, you gave you gave you gave us a very clear vision. Uh, Jacob, I will just with your permission, I will give the floor first to Howard because uh, well, he didn't speak yet, and yeah. I want yeah. then uh, and I will come to you. Yeah. Uh, Howard, I want I want to ask you a question in connection with with, with what uh, Patricia right now said. Do you really believe in uh, in the possibility of increasing trust between people, and would you not rather? develop uh, the human-machine uh, relationship, which will not be based on trust, but on rather knowing how a machine would react to this or that input. And in many cases, for example, when, when developing a corporation or a company, you would rather be thinking of replacing humans with, uh, with machine algorithms, right? So this will be more trustworthy, easier to manage, and uh, mm -hmm. something that will be yielding faster results. Don't you think that will be a better way of living? Uh, rather than developing a, a very difficult and profound cultures of, of human interaction. What's your vision of that? Uh, I think building trust uh, among, <laughs> between people, among, among uh, the staff, for example, in a company, that's, uh, that's the way to go. Uh, in the meantime, we will try to make use of machines. But, but the, most, the, key, the key element would be the trust. Uh, uh, for example, as uh, uh, as I would like to share with you our experience in terms of uh, you know when the uh, pandemic um, outbreak in, uh, in Wuhan already mentioned Wuhan that's the first uh, in January last year, and uh, uh, the government uh, the government announced that every, uh, almost all the cities in China were locked down. So at that time, a lot of people, you know, so worried, worried, worried about losing the job, worried, worried about the future of the company. So um, I think a few things we did really worked, which, uh, uh, for example, in, in the uh, first of all, we try to uh, uh, to ease the anxiety of the staff. And I try to, in the meantime, I try to, uh, and I try to ask them to come down and have uh, communications through uh, uh, digital means. And then we, we have uh, virtual communications and virtual meetings almost every two days because each of us was staying separately. And I was then in Canada, you know, thousands away from the rest of the team. And through this, we build the trust. No one were worried about whether we, I, will, I will be losing the job now or, or in the future. You know, we, we came to the point that we have to save the company. We have to try to work together, try to be create, creative. Because, so that's the first thing we did. 
which shows building the trust, uh, building a big cooperative, re reacting together. That's uh, very, very important. And uh, secondly, on the, uh, on the leadership management level, we, uh, we changed our workflow. You had to change because everyone had, were, everyone were confined to his or her home. You're not, you, you were not supposed to leave even the, your home, your room. So, for example, we, we tried to use uh, social media. We tried to use uh, virtual means of communication instead of, you know, to replace. Uh, there was no, po no possibility for uh, physical, for face-to-face -face communication. And the second thing is, for example, we did, uh, we, we try to make everyone, uh, happy by choosing whether you would like to visit the office once a week when the government allowed to do that, uh, uh, in a matter of three weeks. We did not, uh, ask we did not make it a rule for everyone to be in the office. You just choose, you know, it's your decision whether you want to go to the office or not. But at the management level, we, we, uh, we suggest any team leader should be visiting the office at least one, one day per week. So we change that. And also in the meantime, well, uh, we, uh, uh, we try to, uh, send, for example, food, masks. And our general, general managers in charge of the, uh, you know, the, the administration, administrative people try to do that. Through all these, it built up the trust. And everyone tried to work very hard. And what? And it's a, so. Yes, it, it, it's it's interesting what you are saying. But I have actually two two issues in mind, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure that uh, Royston and uh, Jacob would be able capable of, of answering this these, these issues that I'm having in mind in connection with what you are saying, Howard. Right now, first of all, mm -hmm. from my point of view, people in business. Would, would want to have their own vision of how cooperation and trust and organic development should go. That's, that, that's one kind of vision. But there is the so-called orchestration on the other hand. Governments and regulators would want to have a tighter control of what is happening. And they have the instrument for that. They have the instrument. They also, they have all kinds of surveillance systems. The, all kinds of controlling systems that give them the greater access, easier access to what people are doing, to how they interact. They impose all sorts of limitations here and there, and it's easier to, to govern and control. And from their point of view, this is a matter of stability and sustainability from their point of view. While businesses think differently, this is a, this is a different, but while business from my point of view is relying on education, on relying on people with intelligence, with a vision of the world, with The oh. horizons of how, how this should be developing. In this sense, there is some kind of a some some kind of a contradiction between the two poles. The question is how to find a balance between the two. On the one hand, the availability of wonderful uh, controlling systems, and on the other hand, the desire to de to develop freely and broadly, and uh, making your education the real locomotive of progress. Okay, Jacob, maybe you'll um, you'll start reacting because you want yeah, to something to. Yeah, I'm a bit. Uh, I actually wanted to ask a question to Patricia, and um, maybe I do that li later on because I have to react to what you just say. I, what you just said, I see it just polar opposite. For me, big corporations that rule the world now with their platform economy, we all know the monopolies and all of that. They do what you just said. They give us the impression that we have all kinds of choices, but at the end, their surveillance there. And we are, in a way, we are zoo, we are sucked into some work, some lifestyle, some kind of echo chamber world uh, that I'm, I don't see that this is about trust and education. I don't see that point. 
while I see a lot of benevolent governments that I that still try to do what you just said, government uh, corporate actors would do. Now, of course, most corporate actors do what you say, but the big giants that rule that rule much of the digital world now. Let's be fair. It's not about trust and education and openness and diversity at all. So I think we have to be a bit, 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 bit careful with, the, with, with these labels. Government, orchestration, surveillance, control, bad. Corporate, education, uh, uh, self-fulfillment and so on, good. I, I actually have a very a more differentiated view of that. Um, but coming back to Patricia, if I may, uh, that has to do with, 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 with what also Howard was saying, trust. I totally, absolutely agree with you. I really like the way you frame it. But my question would be, in this, exactly with this crisis now, with this, what we are doing now, if we had a panel where we would look eye to eye and all the hormones that would start going on between trust building, that, that is a very, very physiological, biological thing that's going on. It doesn't work very easily through Zoom meetings. It works much better through meetings. So I wonder, do we not... Is there not a danger in this in this all connected but never really connected new world that we're creating in terms of trust building? So um, thank you. I I also I also think and believe that uh, trust can really become uh, something tangible if you meet in person. You know, if you are in synchro and and if you are together in the same place and if you start to co-create. I mean, in the beginning, Martin was saying that the, 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 the future would be a world of collaboration and co-creation, or I think it's Royston who said it. Um, and, and so for that, I think people need to be in the same space. Um, going back to your, um, to your comment about, um, about, you know, that, that, that companies, that, that companies that, that now rule the, the world in, 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 in size and in, in pack, impact. I think we all uh, belong to a generation which is not the millennial generation. And they are um, actively involved now in finding jobs and being uh, professionally involved. And they see the world in a complete different way as we have seen it before. Uh, they, if they work for a company, it's because they want to make an impact. It's because uh, the values are aligned with them. And, um, and so I, I, don't, I don't think they will continue to work for this massively big companies that start to squeeze, I, um, to squeeze yeah, I, consumers. And, and so the world is changing and the world is switching. And I think I have a, a big hope in millennials um, being very actively involved in, uh, and professionally and willing to make an impact yeah. and changing the dynamic of work. And so by this, we will change the workplace and the future of work will be completely different as the one we have uh, lived or we have created as well. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm still very hopeful and I'm an optimist, uh, but I'm working to make uh, what I think should come, um, to, to make it real, to make it come. I, thank you. I, I like that. I like thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Royston, I want to ask you, what, what, what is your vision of the role of education in this new world and, uh, and the points of growth? Do you think the universities and the, and the world of education actually to change and uh, adapt these systems to the to the new world and the curriculum, the way we see the way the way we see the younger generation who is actually should go in keeping with the tradition, should go in keeping with the, with the tracks that have been set already by the previous generation. What's your vision of that? I, I think first, if I comment on what was previously said, I think you need a secure base which is physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual intelligence to create trust. Um, and a friend of mine, Art Haribo, whose factory was destroyed by a tsunami. His model was joy and fun, and that's why they rebuilt the factory in three months. I think we've lost joy and fun in education. We have become focused on mindsets uh, down. I think Socrates said that education was kindling the flame, not filling the vessel. I think most of our systems have been fo focused on filling the vessel and filling the vessel by some notion of what you need to know based upon history. Now, the one thing we know about the present is you can't use history because everything is changing. So we have to create the ability for young people to have sound moral judgment, to critically think and to be able to explore and manifest in a different way. So our education 
system is one of containment rather than uh, evolution. And I think by looking at the technology of hybrid education, looking at uh, people learning together in, in groups, as I said, storyteller, listener and observer, we discovered that they can dissipate 80% of trauma just by talking to this micro clusters. So we have ability of, of reducing trauma. We have, they also act as a self-checking system. So we found in education, they will ask each other questions that, uh, that instead of engaging the teacher, the teacher becomes a facilitator. So if you create this dynamic education system where people self-learn, they self-check and they self-evolve, then maybe we have other opportunities. I think we, this top-down policy that we have in education is perhaps needs to be challenged. We have global problems and we need to discover local solutions. Mm, thank you. Uh, from your point of view, maybe, Mariana, maybe, maybe you will ask, uh, answer my question. From your point of view, who defines the future, individuals or, or teams of people? Because we have visionaries on the one hand, we have, we have people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and, and other visionaries, and we have a uh, big corporation, big teams of people uh, who are working to, together. What, what is defining the future? What is, where to look for the points of new growth? Uh, well, our future is, uh, and present is quite complicated, so uh, we could not say that there is a single or several uh, technologically optimistic, uh, neoliberal, uh, transhumanist, and those who uh, believe that technology will build on our capacity and uh, each decision uh, will be provided by artificial intelligence. But this uh, also gives power to uh, the complete opposite trend of uh, uh, neoconservatism, uh, and supporters of this trend who uh, believe that we have uh, to turn back to our uh, human origins and not to allow these algorithms to uh, conduct and to, to curate our lives and to uh, direct our decision making. So I think to extremes. Uh, but what is uh, my message is that we have to, to use uh, the technologies and all of uh, this uh, potential uh, for good, but not forgetting that we are human. And uh, this also shows that uh, we uh, put an accent on trust. Trust is the currency of our time, as uh, somebody uh, said that recently. So uh, uh, in between those, those two very strong trends, we'll move forward and we'll see. Uh, but this is also politically influenced and you can see all, all over the Europe and, and the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dear colleagues, we have one minute left. And, uh... writing to each other and uh, following each other's achievements and publications in networks and exchanging points of view. I'm very grateful to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariana Todorova. Thank you, okay. Patricia Bonnet. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Royston Flute. Thank you, Jacob Edler, Howard Wu. People from different parts of the world today sharing their vision and the Horasis Extraordinary Forum, uh, sharing the vision of how the world is developing, built on trust, co-collaboration, co-working of people together. And I am Mark Lincoln, professor at Moscow State University, moderating this small panel. And I'm very grateful to all those who are participating in this panel today. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. And you can- Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye